Welcome, folks. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Jacob. I, I work at Heroku. I run the security team there. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you about Heroku. So my guess is that about half of you probably have never even heard of Heroku before. Another of the remaining, another half of you haven't tried it before. So we're going to start at the very beginning and explain exactly what Heroku is. But then I'm going to dive in, show you a technical demo, and by the end of this talk, um, I'll have shown you how to write and deploy a very simple web application um, to Heroku, and we, we'll talk about some scaling, and we'll talk about performance tuning, and that sort of stuff. So what, what is Heroku? So Heroku starts with a simple observation, which is that applications require infrastructure. If you want to run a modern-day application, you need a lot of moving parts. Um, so this is actually kind of interesting. Uh, this is my sort of go-to diagram when I want to talk about how complicated modern web infrastructure is. Um, and I realized as I was putting this deck together, I've been using this for um, uh, about eight years now. This is from 2007. This is the architecture of LiveJournal. Do you remember LiveJournal? It's a good, it's a good diagram because LiveJournal is actually one of the first web applications to be architected in a way that modern developers, people building apps like Facebook and, and, and LinkedIn and those sorts of things would recognize. And th the reason I bring this up is it's important to point out that um, that's your code. That's your application that you write. All the rest of it, that's all other services that you need to somehow figure out how to run in order to be able to develop and scale your application. So you've got two choices. You can learn all of that stuff, or you can use a platform. And so Heroku is really about letting customers focus on their applications and letting us do the rest. You know, I like to say we wear the pager. We're the ones who get paged when our infrastructure has a problem. We build all the rest of the stuff. You concentrate on your app. If it's time for your application to serve more traffic, you literally drag a slider to increase the amount of traffic that your application is, is able to handle. It's that easy. And applications large and small use, use Heroku. Macy's is one. To Toyota Europe, if you buy a car in Europe, you're using a Heroku application as you configure the color and the trim and the paint options. Uh, apartment list, you're looking for a crazy expensive place to live here in San Francisco? Apartment list will help find out how depressingly expensive it is. Um, the Internet of Things, another very popular use for Heroku. Lutron, they make lights and heaters and that sort of stuff. Their app, when you control your applications, is running, the back end is running on Heroku. Um, Heroku has proven scale. We're the largest platform on the planet, largest platform as a service. We handle over 5 billion requests per day. That's some serious scale, and we can, and we can handle it. Heroku provides everything that you need to build customer-facing applications. So the core of your Heroku app is something we call a dyno, which is an abstraction around your application code. You can think of it as a really small virtual machine that runs just your application and none of the rest of the overhead of an operating system. Um, and dynos scale horizontally. So if, to serve a little bit of traffic, you use one dyno. You need to double your traffic. You use two dynos, 10, 100, whatever. We can handle it. We provide a PostgreSQL database um, that we run and maintain internally. We have some of the best SQL database engineers working for us, contributors to the open source project. Um, and we also have a marketplace of other add-ons. So you want to run Redis, you want to run MongoDB, you need load testing, you need email sending or email delivery, all available through the add-on marketplace and be con con configured and added to your app in a matter of seconds. One big advantage that we have over other platforms is being part of the Salesforce family. We have a product called Heroku Connect, which is a bi-directional sync between your Salesforce data and your Heroku Postgres application. So you can write customer-facing applications in, on Heroku and back office applications on force.com that both interact and deal with the same data, and everything is transparently synced bi-directionally. So that's the... Uh, that's the 100,000-foot overview. Let's drop down maybe to the 10,000-foot view, and I'll give you sort of an overview of what Heroku looks like from a technical standpoint. And then I'll dive in and give an actual demo, and I'll show you how to build and run an application. <clears throat> so Heroku is sort of language agnostic. We we don't care what language you use to develop on Heroku. You can use whatever language you're already familiar with. 
We sort of have core support for a bunch of languages that we run and maintain internally. Ruby, Python, JavaScript, Node.js specifically, Java, PHP. But basically any other language you can think of can be supported through a feature called build packs, which essentially specify the runtime that your application runs underneath. Um, so if you, your favorite language isn't up there, chances are someone has already built support for it, and if they haven't, you can do it yourself. It's a fairly simple API. Heroku is developer-oriented. We, we put sort of the, the developer first. All of our interface, all of our, all of our usability, all of our um, tools are oriented towards people who already are professional software developers. And so the main way you deploy to Heroku is through Git, through version control. We've sort of noticed that version control is something that is a necessity that every developer needs to do to be successful in their job, and so to deploy to Heroku, you do it directly through your version control tool. And because of this, we can provide a really sweet um, deployment experience where you can write code locally on your laptop. I just wrote some code on the train on the way into San Francisco this morning, no internet connection, running locally on my laptop, playing around with new things. When you're ready to then run that, it's one line, you can push it to Heroku and see your application running immediately get feedback and iterate very quickly. Our developers on our platform can and do deploy hundreds of times a day. Um, we use Heroku, of course, internally all over the place, and we, as a company, deploy hundreds, sometimes even thousands of times a day. It's, deployment is not a, it's not a big thing with Heroku. You just sort of push little incremental changes as you need them. <clears throat> Heroku also provides um, some strong guarantees around erosion. When you do that, git push Heroku master, what you're doing is you're packaging up your code and you're pushing it into Heroku, and Heroku's gonna do a few steps there. It's gonna create an environment, that's the build pack I talked about, which kind of is the base language and runtime that your application runs under. It's gonna compile that into what we call a slug, which is sort of a compiled version of your application. At that point, it adds configuration and any add-ons, databases, services you've added, and it bundles all of that up into a release. And those release objects are immutable. There's only, every time you make a new release, every time you make a change, you have a new release. And so, if you've made a mistake, it's very easy to roll back. You can very easily say, oh, nope, version 10 was messed up, let's go back to version nine, and in a second, you're now pointing at the old release, and so there's always sort of a, trail of everything that you've done and a very easy way to go back, uh, back in time, as it were. So a little bit more about how the deployment process works. Um, as I said, you kind of push the code in and Heroku's gonna do a bunch, of, a bunch of stuff, pulling in your code, building it with the build pack, setting environment variables, and when it's done, it creates that release object. And that's what runs inside these, these dyno environments. And so the dyno is just sort of a, a packaged running version of your code that your application actually interacts with. And you can then scale out those dynos horizontally as you need more of them. And so the developer workflow is mostly oriented around a bunch of command line tools. We've observed that most developers seem to be pretty comfortable working at a command line interface as opposed to web-based interfaces, so we provide a command line interface. Uh, there is also a web-based console that can do all of the same things, and then there's also a low-level API, so you can build higher-level abstractions on top of Heroku's building blocks uh, in your own code. So. That's the high-level overview. Now, let's dive in and do a demo. So, I'm actually gonna try to do a live demo here, which means stepping away from my slides. Um, if you download these slides later, you'll find that they have everything I'm gonna write. So, it's a high-level overview of what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna write an app, a very, very simple app. Uh, I'm gonna use Python, that's the language I'm most familiar with, but I could do this demo in, in any language that I, that I wanted to. As you'll see, it's very, very, it's the simplest app that I could possibly write. I'm gonna run it locally here on my laptop to make sure that I've written the code correctly. I'm going to add this application to my version control. I'm gonna create a Heroku application as a container for this code that I've written. Then I'm gonna deploy, I'll do the first deploy and maybe I'll poke around at it and you know, show that it's running. Um, 
Then I'll talk about some sort of common things that you do in most applications and sort of show how they work on Heroku. I'll show how logging works and how log retention works so you can kind of track your app through its paces. I'll talk a little bit about these add-ons and show how you add pieces to the application to perform uh, other services, other data stores. I'll talk about configuration variables, how you control the sort of setup and configuration of your app. I'll talk about those releases, demonstrate rolling back and rolling forward. And finally, I'll talk about scale, show you how to scale up your application to handle load. So let's give this a try. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Oops, sorry, I'm going to get my script open here. All right, so the first step I'm going to do is I'm going to make a Python, a Python application here. Um, this is, if you're familiar with Python, you'll recognize these steps. These are the same steps that I would go through in any, when making any sort of new Python application. I'm creating a, a specific directory structure, I'm installing Python, and I'm installing Flask, which is a lightweight Python web framework, and GUnicorn, which is the server framework that runs that, that runs uh, my application. Um, so I've now gone through that basic setup step, and now I'm going to make, and now I'm going to make a simple Python web application. So here is, here's my application. Uh, can you see that in the back? Should I bump the font size up? I'm gonna bump it up a few notches. Better? Okay. So, Simplest possible Python application. You probably don't even need to know much Python to, to guess that this is going to display Hello Dreamforce in the web browser. Um, but let's, uh, let's double check locally to make sure that that actually does what I expect it to do. And here's my web browser running locally. Mm -hmm. And there it is. You can see it says hello Dreamforce. So this is my application running locally. Um, one thing to point out so far, I haven't typed the word Heroku yet, right? I'm just writing a Python application here. And this would be the same in whatever language that you happen to be using. Heroku is not a framework that you have to download and run. Heroku runs your code. And you'll, you'll see this repeatedly as we go. So I need to do a few more things. Um, I, need to, I need to tell Heroku what my dependencies are. And so these are all, my, all the external Python packages that my application depends on. So every language that you use is going to have some sort of way of specifying dependencies. For Ruby, it would be Ruby gems. For Node, it's your package.json. For Java, it's a Maven file. You're going to tell Heroku Here's my app, and here's all the other pieces that you have to pull, pull in to build my app. And you'll notice that I'm specifying the version numbers specifically. That's part of this erosion resistance. It means that every time Heroku goes to build my application, it's going to use the exact same version of everything. So if I run this application today, tomorrow, next year, it's going to run exactly the same, regardless of um, what may have changed in the world since I wrote that code. This is very important, because we need to be able to deploy your application at any time you know, for any reason. So the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make something called a proc file. And this specifies what process types make up my web application. Um, and this is a semi-standard. Uh, other platforms use the same, the same uh, format as well for specifying what to run. And so here I'm just saying I have a web process. There's this particular incantation in Python that I need to run this web process, and I've put it in here. If I wanted to run background workers to drain a job queue or to do background processing, I would put the, those same sorts of tasks here in this file. A more complicated app, I'll show you an example towards the end, would have more of these process types. So at this point, 
I can now check my code into, into Git. So the first thing I'm gonna tell it to do is ignore some stuff. This is just to make it go faster so I don't have to push all this code over the conference Wi-Fi. And now I can create a Git repository, add my files. So one important thing about using version control as a deployment mechanism is that it forces me to follow um, a, a best practice here, which is to make sure that all my code is versioned and tracked. Um, again, we sort of noticed that version control is considered a best practice by most application developers, and so we kind of bake it into the core of the product. Um, Heroku wants to encourage you to do, to do the right thing. We want to make best practices easier than, than not doing them. So at this point, I have some code. It runs locally. Um, again, notice I, haven't, I have not yet typed the word Heroku at all. This is just a plain old Python app. And now I'm going to start typing the word Heroku. Now I'm going to tell Heroku to run this application. So let's create an application. So Heroku create, creates a new application, uh, which is basically an empty container to run my code. So every application, you see I gave it a name, Happy Dreamforce 2014. And that has an associated URL, happydreamforce2014.herokuapp.com. You get that URL automatically as you get ready to sort of deploy your application later. Uh, you can add whatever custom domain you might want to that application later on. So now I have an application, but it's, but it's empty. If I visit that in the, in the browser, you'll just see, you know, you haven't deployed yet. There's nothing here. So let's deploy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type git push. Heroku master, and that says take my local code and push it to Heroku. And so this is gonna run, this is probably gonna take 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and so what this is doing is it's, it's looking at my code, it says, oh hey, you have a Python app, it's gonna install my dependencies, uh, the runtime, I could use a different version of Python if I wanted to, I could be using Ruby or JavaScript. Now it's gonna install my dependencies, um, it's building this application slug so that every time this application runs, uh, it runs the exact same code. Um, and now my application is launched. Happy Dreamforce deployed to Heroku. So I should be able to hit this again and hello Dreamforce. There's my application. And this is actually running. You know, I can, I can prove it to you by, by looking at my logs. Whoop. And uh, hitting reload a few times. And there are those lines showing up in my logs. You can see it's taking, uh, taking me two milliseconds to serve that application. So this is just running my, running my Python code. It's running on our cloud. This is, um, you know, this, this is production ready. You can hit this in your web browser right now. It's public. You can, you can view it. Too many of you do. It'll probably not be able to serve everyone. But as we'll see later, I can scale it up incredibly easily. So this flow is going to be basically the same if you're running, regardless of what, of what, regardless of what language you're using. You'll write some code in, in the language of your choice. You'll give Heroku some information about how to run that code. And then you'll push it to Heroku, and we'll run the application. All right. So let's talk about what you can do now that you have an application running. So I just showed you, I just showed you looking at logs in the console. Um, so what if I want to add custom logging code to my application so that I can record things that my application is doing while it runs? So let's look at what that looks like. Let's, um, let's, uh, let's add some logging to this code. So I'm going to import the standard Python logging package. Um, this is just a little package that's baked into Python. So if you were in Java, you'd use log4j. If you were in Ruby, there's a variety of Ruby logs, or you could even just use, you know, print, puts, console.println, whatever. Um, I have to do, to do that, is that right? Let me double check my script. Ah, that's what I need to do. <laughs> So let's add a little bit of, of uh, debug logging. 
So I've made a change to my application. So what I need to do now, every time I make a change, I need to commit it to, to Git. So I'll say added logging. So I, I made some changes. And now I've just checked this in locally. If I run the code locally, I'll see that logging stuff happen. But if I look at my logs, um, I'm not going to see this. I'm not going to see this stuff show up yet. Ah, cool. I see some people in the audience hitting the app. Great. Pro prove to you that I'm not faking it. Um, so I'm not seeing my logging stuff show up in the app yet because I haven't yet deployed. So the version that's running on Heroku is self-contained and separate, and I have to make an explicit, you know, hey, I'm ready to push a new version. So let's do it now. So again, git push Heroku master. Um, and again, this is going to take you know, a few seconds here. I'll use it as an opportunity to sneak a drink. One thing you'll notice, it was a little faster the next time because Heroku is detecting that I haven't really made any changes, so it's just going to sort of recompile and, and, and change the application. I haven't changed my dependencies. I haven't added or removed add-ons, so it's easy for it to make a new deploy. And so now let's watch my logs. <clears throat> uh -oh. Looks like I made a mistake. <laughs> so I'm, I had a bug there. Oops. <laughs> ah. So what actually happened, if, you, if you were viewing this, if you try to view this right now, you're actually going to see an application error because I, I had a bug in my code. Didn't test. Should have, should have written some tests, Jacob. Um, so I fixed it. And we'll deploy again. So this is probably a good time to point out that in, in the real world, if this was an actual real production app, I probably wouldn't be cowboy coding and pushing to production without tests. What I'd probably be doing is writing code against the development branch, pushing to a staging application that then I could run some sort of continuous integration against. And when that passes, I could then promote that code and deploy it to production. That's what a workflow would look like, roughly, if this was a real application. That's similar to the way we use it internally. But since I'm just doing a demo, I, you know, See to the pants. See how it goes. All right. So at this point, yep. And so we can see here that every time I get a request, I'm seeing my information in the log, and the application is working again, and I can see my, my debug logging going on. So again, you know, to reiterate, I haven't done anything Heroku-specific here, right? I'm just using the basic facilities built into my language, and they hook into the, the platform. And this is part of that you know, Heroku giving you the freedom to write whatever application you want in whatever language you want. You don't have to ask yourself, how do I do logging on Heroku? You just say, oh, I already know Java. I'm just going to do logging, and Heroku's going to pick it up. So um, Heroku gives me some, some tools to, play, to, to, to see my logs. I can do things like source equals web just to show the logs coming from just my app. Um, oops, it should be source equals app. To see just the stuff coming from my app, I can say source equals router, just to see the code, the, the requests coming from the HTTP router, which I'm doing something wrong, so we'll skip it. But um, Heroku is not re going to retain any logs for me. This is just like a stream of logs coming through. And obviously, in a real-world production application, you want your application logs to you know, go somewhere. And so, well, go where? Well, as it happens, there's a bunch of really cool companies out there that provide um, logging tools. There's Logly, there's Splunk, there's Sumo Logic, there's Paper Trail, and all of these companies make logging packages that will ingest logs from wherever you want to send it and give you really nice interfaces on them. And you know, you could go to one of these, you could go to one of these companies, you could set up an account, you could 
you could figure out how to wire it up to Heroku, but we also offer most of these through our add-ons marketplace, which makes an incredibly quick and easy way to add these types of add-on services. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna say add-ons add paper trail. So paper trail is one of the logging tools that you can use. It's, I think the interface is pretty nice. So I'm gonna add paper trail. It's now added. The basic paper trail add-on is free. If I wanted longer retention, I could pay more and get a better, um, you know, better quality of service. And, uh, and now I will open the paper trail add-on. And so now it's not showing me any events, but let's go ahead and reload a few times. And... <laughs> Come on, there we go, and we're getting some logs showing up in my, in my paper trail add-on, right? Didn't have to create a separate account, don't have to have separate you know, billing information, just add the add-on and it, and, it, and it works. And if I decide that, hey, you know, I'm not really sure I like paper trail, I wanna try Logly, it's just as easy to add another add-on there. So let's talk real quick about a few few add-ons. Um, so Heroku's add-on marketplace has um, uh, about 120, 130 different add-ons, uh, and there's, a, there's an API so that companies can create, um, can create and sell add-ons through our marketplace. Um, and these are all sort of developer-oriented tools, so data stores, um, tools for load testing, tools for log retention, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I want to mention a few just to give you an idea of you know, what's out there. Um, I mentioned Heroku Postgres. So this is sort of our data store of choice. This is, it is offered to the add-ons marketplace, but it's also something we run internally. So this is a standard Postgres SQL database. Um, we run you know, the largest uh, public fleet of Postgres databases in the world. We know a little bit about them and how to make them scale. Um, there also are uh, MySQL add-ons run by other companies. We, we like Postgres, so we, we run it in-house. Um, New Relic, uh, if you've done application development, web application development before, you're probably familiar with New Relic. It's one of the best tools for diagnosing and understanding errors and performance problems in your application. Uh, New Relic is incredibly easy to add, just as easy as I added um, Paper Trail just a minute ago. Uh, there's also things like Postmark. Um, so Postmark is basically an, an inbox for your app. You get an email address, and every email that gets sent to that address gets translated into a post request against your web app. So you can handle incoming email the same way you handle web requests. So it makes it really easy to build apps that integrate with, um, with the web. Similarly, there you can use Twilio. Uh, they've got a booth here. They're a really sweet um, SMS and MMS integration toolkit. Uh, and I mentioned before Heroku Connect, that's another in-house add-on which provides synchronization between your Postgres database and your, um, and your Salesforce data, which is pretty great and kind of magic when you see it. Um, stop by our booth at the Dev Zone if you want to see a demo of it, it's pretty cool. So what's next here? Ah, yes. So another basic building block of, of Heroku are um, what are called configuration variables. Um, and you would use these for configuration for your app, but also, also secrets like, like keys and, and, and API tokens and that sort of stuff. There's sort of a separate storage for these away from your code, away from your database. And they're, and they're, um, they're versioned the same way your code is so that you can sort of version configuration and environment changes the same way you, you version code changes. So I'll give you an example here. Um, we'll do this. Instead of saying, hello, Dreamforce, we'll say hello to something based on an environment variable. So I won't make the same mistake I did last time. I will, I will test this locally, make sure that it works. All right, seems to work. So now... Add environment. Uh, 
So configuration variables show up as in, in the process environment. So in Python, that's os.envire, and in, in Ruby, that's the env global hash. This shows up sort of as, the, as the, the, the operating environment for your language, and you can read it and set it on any platform, but Heroku kind of has some special tools for interacting with that, with that process environment. So let's see, am I, are we done with deploy yet? One more sec. Okay, so nothing really has changed here yet. Um, still just says hello Dreamforce, but now it's reading from an environment variable. So what I can do is I can change that. So let's say um, Heroku config set um, name equals Jacob. Let's make it say hi to me instead of to um, everyone. <clears throat> so what this is actually doing, notice that it says... Uh, V8. So pay attention to that. It's actually created a new, an entire new release just because I've changed the configuration variable. Because environment changes might cause my code to break, right? You turn debug off and suddenly everything breaks. I'm sure you've had that happen. So I want to also version any environmental changes that I make to my code, not just, not just code changes. Um, and now it says, hello, Jacob. And if I want to change that again, I can say, um, can set it back to set it back to Dreamforce, and again, v9, and it's changed. Mm -hmm. There it is, and of course I can. Uh, of course I can get those variables as well and see and see what they are, um, etc. So we've been talking about these versions, so let's, let me show you how that, how that works. So again, I've mentioned every time I do a deploy, it's creating sort of a, a static, immutable release of my code. So let's take a look at those. If I say Heroku releases, it's gonna show me all of the different versions of my code, and you can see, okay, so I did a deploy, I did a deploy, I did a deploy, I added the add-on, I did another deploy, I set some config there's. So let's say I want to, um, so right now it's saying, Dreamforce, because I set it there, and I'd say, oh, you know, I want to want to make it say, you know, say hi to me again. So I can say Heroku config, sorry, Heroku rollback v8. I can say go back to version eight, and it's going to say okay. And notice how quick that was, right? That code was already compiled and running, or already compiled, it wasn't running. So all that Heroku had to do is just say, oh, you want version eight? Great, I'll point your URL to version eight now. And now it's back to saying hi to me. And notice that that. It didn't actually precisely go back in time. It actually created a new version, right? It made a copy of version 8 and deployed it as version 10. Because you don't want to lose, you don't want to lose history when you do a rollback, right? So now this works. So let's, you know, let's try it again. I can roll back to version 9. And you know, we're, back to, uh, we're back to saying hi to everyone, I think. Come on, Wi-Fi. So I get erosion resistance, I can roll back quickly. This is definitely one of the things that lets you do that type of continuous deployment. If, if mistakes can be fixed very quickly, it's a little easier to make those mistakes. It's a little less risky if you can stage your roll and go, oh no, pull it back, I'm not done with that. So finally, the last piece of the puzzle, um, now I wanna make my application live and I need to handle more traffic. So to do that, I use the Heroku PS command, processes command. And so right now I'm running one, one process, one dyno. And so I wanna scale that up. I can say Heroku PS scale web equals four. So now I can run four times the amount of traffic. Um, and I can show you kind of what this looks like looking at the logs. You can see as I load the page, Notice that we're seeing web one, web three, web two. So it's made multiple dynos that are running my same code and it's scaling that horizontally. And as I need to add more traffic, I can easily add more dynos. Um, there are also, I can also scale to different types of dynos. So there's what's called a 2x dyno, which is 
twice as big, twice as much memory, twice as much compute. So maybe I don't need, maybe I don't need four times horizontally, maybe I need, you know, some more space vertically. So let's go to two, two X dynos. So now I'm running two, two X dynos. Um, and there's, you know, I can, I can scale these up dynamically. Uh, there's a soft limit of 100 per app, but you can contact us and we'll raise that limit. There's essentially no real limit on how, on how far this can go. Um, and if I want to understand the performance of my application, um, I, can use, uh, I can use some stuff built into our dashboard. So everything I've been showing you from the command line is also possible through our, through our, web-based, um, through our web-based dashboard. Um, so here's my app in the dashboard, and you can see that. So let's set this back to a, let's scale this back down to a 1x, a single 1x dyno here. I can scale it back down there. You can see I could have added my add-ons here. Um, and so there's, I can do everything that I could have done, that I did uh, online, or I did on the, in the, on the command line through this web app, but I can also get information about the performance of my application. So this is a different app. Um, my current app has no performance problems. It's too simple. But this is a different app that's doing a fairly high. So this is doing about four, three to 400 requests per minute. Um, and I can see what my average response time is. I can see my CPU load, memory usage. Um, and I can notice that this application has had been having a bunch of a bunch of errors lately. It's been having some timeouts. It's been having some memory quota errors. Some more timeouts. Some more timeouts. So something's something's wrong with this application. I definitely see some errors having here, and it's giving me some suggesting. You know, look at some suggestions. Look at slow requests. Add more dynos. Maybe you want more process per dyno. And I could use the, the metrics here uh, as information about how to sort of scale up and run this application. Um, uh, larger. So, the key points is that the, the, the sort of key difference around Heroku from a lot of other platforms is that Heroku builds a pop of tools that developers already know and already understand and are already using. We take an approach of, of, of paving the cow paths, look to see what developers do and make that the way that Heroku works. We want to be as seamless and, and, and as disappearing as possible. You know, we, we're happiest when you forget all about us. We want to make it very easy to scale, um, and we want to reduce the operations effort. We want, to, we want to wear the pager so that you don't have to. If you want to learn more, um, Heroku.com is our site. We have a bunch of getting started guides at uh, devcenter.heroku.com. Uh, and we also have a booth in the dev zone, which is actually where I'm going to be just after this talk. So if you want to talk to me specifically and don't catch me between, come over to the booth and you can find me and, uh, and we can talk there. And uh, you can always contact me, Jacob, at Heroku.com. Uh, thank you very much.